My name is Dan. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, the, uh, this is my second year here at Tech Phoenix. I'm very happy to actually be a speaker this time. This is really kind of cool. So um, I'm here to talk about sort of growing your audience. Now, before I even get started on this, I want to allay some misconceptions. I have a fairly small podcast. I am not Leo Laporte and Twit. I am not Dan Benjamin, even though my name is Dan. And I do not have any connection to the 5 by 5 network. My audience is fairly small. But I was able to grow it in some surprising ways that looking back on it, you know, hindsight being 2020, this is cool, it makes sense after a while, but at the time it kind of blew my mind. So to kind of build off uh, the last speaker here, and we're going to talk about building your audience beyond what it was and maybe expanding your reach a bit, if we can call it that. I'm very bad at business terminology, and one of the reasons is, as we'll get to know me, um, is because I am not in a business at all. I work for the government and have for pretty much most of my life. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. So if, if we kind of know where I'm coming from, maybe we'll kind of have an idea of where the heck we're going to. So my name is Dan, and I get bored really easily. And busy hands are happy hands, and an occupied mind is not homicidal. So as soon as I get bored with something, I try doing something else. I'll try anything. If it's creative, I'm into that. So I write, I draw, I speak, I do podcasting, I'm a musician, um, I'm all of these things. Cyberpunk, historian, librarian, blah, blah, blah. There's no bragging there. This is just a testament to the fact that I get bored easily. But for the purposes of this talk, there's just a few here that I'm going to concentrate on. That is cyberpunk, librarian, podcast. And as it happens, the name of my show is Cyberpunk Library. Um, I am a uh, public librarian. I've been working in libraries almost 20 years now, since I was 19 years old. Um, I have a very technologically focused background, strangely enough, for many public librarians, as we'll get into. Um, because when I was 10 years old, my parents bought me what was one of the state-of-the-art things at the time. It was a Commodore 64. It was beautiful. Still miss my Commodore. I still emulate my Commodore on other computers, so I can play. I've got one I will sell you. I <laughs> might buy that. <laughs> anyway, so <coughs> Cyberpunk Librarian um, is a show about the changing nature of libraries and how technology can make uh, make life easier for libraries, users, etc. Because there's really two kinds of people in almost any library. There's the people who work there, and then there's the people they're helping. What you want to call those people is up to you. Some librarians call the other people customers, or patrons, or users, or whatever. I don't care. I lost that battle years ago when we decided to call them customers, and they're not coming to me to buy anything. Whatever. So this is what the show is about. You know, just that. And it may surprise people to find out that, yes, libraries really are changing. If you haven't been to one in a while, you don't even have to go. You might have to go get a library card. Then after that, you can do all of your work, all of your checking out, all of your downloading, all of your, all of your books, all of your e-books, all of your movies on the website. I know, because I run the website. That's my job. You can blame me for the county's library website for certain things. There's some things I can't change because I work for the government, as we said before. So yes, libraries are really changing. And technology can help. I firmly believe that you know technology helps make anything. And I think we sometimes forget how basic technology is. We think technology, MacBooks, smartphones, computers, little clickers that I don't even know what the heck this thing does. Really, technology is a hammer. I can do something with a hammer that I cannot do with my fist. That's technology. So technology can help, no matter what it is. Obviously, most of the time it's computer tech. Sometimes it's just ideas and workflow. But libraries have a sort of problem. When it comes to getting the long end of the budget stick, we never do. We are always sort of the low end of the totem pole. We get our budget. That is our budget. Sometimes that budget is cut to support other things. 
that's the way life is. So, technology libraries working together, but how? And for my show, the answer is free and inexpensive software and technology. I focus a lot on FOSS, free and open source software. I focus a lot on inexpensive ways to do things with stuff you might already have. Um, because working for the government, you will find that you can't throw anything away. It has to be surplus, which means it goes to another place that I don't even know where that exists. I think it's a black hole. Um, so, like in our IT department, we have computers on shelves and monitors above that. And we can't throw them away. Just chuck them. We can't just recycle them. So we've got this tech lying around doing nothing. That bugs me because that tech could be doing something. So, okay, that in mind. All of that stuff that I've just bored your senses with, I'm sure. So, in the context of my show, we have to figure out what my niche is. Now, this would apply to your show. Now, granted, throughout this talk, I'm going to be talking about this from the perspective of a podcaster, because that is what I do. If you're a YouTuber, then your viewers, you know, your audience is a viewer. If you're a podcaster, your audience is a listener. If you're a blogger, your audience is a reader, but they're your audience. You just have different types of words for them. So the question is, what's my niche? Well, the niche is kind of small, which isn't to say it's tiny or anything. I mean, it's a niche, and by definition, niches are small places, but niches can be important. And because we're, into, we're all into new media, we know that this, you know, this is the case. So I guess that you could say that my audience is technologically-minded public librarians. Now, that's a niche. That is not Leo Laporte. That is not Dan Benjamin. That is not Joe Rogan. I have a pretty focused audience, at least for my podcast. Or so I thought. We're going to get into that as we go along. So, technologically minded public librarians. And when you think of public librarians, you probably think of Mrs. Bertrand here. Bertrand? Yeah, I think Bertrand. Who, I assure you, is wearing glasses behind those text, uh, that text box. Um, you know, she is using a computer, but this is sort of like the stereotypical image view of a public librarian, or any librarian, really. You know, older lady, glasses, floral print jacket. I mean, this is so stereotypical that this image comes from Wikimedia Commons. <laughs> so, this is a public domain image of a public librarian. But we're not who you think we are. These are some of my coworkers, some of my friends. Some people that I've worked with, some people that I've never met in real life but only talked to online. All of them are public librarians or librarians in one way, shape, or form. Uh, Corrine and Carrie work within the uh, county library system. Uh, this is one of my best friends, Holly. She used to be my supervisor. This is Polly Olita Farrington, who literally wrote the book on using WordPress in libraries. This man right here, I am simultaneously jealous and hateful of, because if you've ever heard of a bookmobile where the big RV looking thing would come to a site and you could check out books for it. He does that, except if you'll notice just off the top of his head here, there is a Norwegian flag. Thomas Brevik lives in, Mo in uh, Norway and he is a book boat library. The boat goes up and down the fjords, delivering books, and it's just, oh god, I want to do that. First, I'll have to learn Norwegian. So, these are all technologically minded public librarians. Jessamine West, for instance, is very famous in the library community for her writing and her talking about tech and libraries. So, we're not who you think we are. We're not all like this poor woman back here, who is probably gone now. Anyway, <laughs> so the thing is, is there is kind of this whole world out there. And though I had this audience of technologically minded public librarians, public, because there are academic librarians, there are business librarians, there are corporate librarians, I didn't care about any of them, to be honest. I've never worked in a business library. I've worked in academia for one year. That was enough. So, maybe there are others who like libraries and technology, too. Okay. So, before we go on, 
And before I actually sort of tell you about how this audience building kind of began totally by accident, I should probably tell you a little bit about Nightwise.com. Um, Nightwise.com is another podcast, uh, a technology podcast that I literally fell over on another podcasting network that does nothing but syndicate other podcasts. You submit your podcast to them, they'll play it on a calendar. It's called Hacker Public Radio. Um, I was listening to Hacker Public Radio. This show came on. I really freaking enjoyed it. So I started listening to it. Um, became a fan. And this was years ago. He's been at this for quite some time. Um, mostly I liked it for the technology bits because his philosophies of technology blend well with mine. Nightwise is what, uh, is what he calls a slider, where he doesn't use just one kind of thing. He's not a Windows man. He is not an Apple man. He is not an Android or iOS man. He is an everything guy. And being what I am and doing what I do, I have to do that too. And as things go, we also share a love of one of the greatest things ever created, which is space music. Little aside there, I stole about 50% of my show's format from Nightwise.com. So, one fine day, Nightwise puts out on one of the social media things, hey, I'm looking for someone to do some guest content. I, you know, I don't remember if he was taking a break or had a hiatus or something like that. And I was like, crap, I could do something for Nick Barnes. Why not? That'd be great. That'd be fun. So I contacted him, and we kind of started working together. Um, I would make something for him. It occasionally appears on his show or on his site, something like that. There's no money involved. I am a librarian. I'm into the idea of giving stuff away. I don't really charge anything for anything. There are no ads on my show or my site. So, at one point in the uh, discussion that I've had with Nightwise, I found that he listens to my show. And I was all, um, because he's, he's a tech guy, yes, but he's not a librarian. I believe he uses a library occasionally. But why are you listening to my show? You're, this is really kind of aimed at libraries. Um, my last show, as a matter of fact, uh, a couple weeks ago, I've got one coming out probably Monday, um, was about Raspberry Pis. And Raspberry Pis are big right now. I mean, you hear about them in the maker community and little $35 computer you can do anything with. And great, you know, but lots of people are talking about Raspberry Pis. I specifically talk about what I'm doing with one in a library setting. So, to find out that someone was interested in you know, that application of technology was kind of mind-blowing. So, there's this little service on the internet, perhaps you've heard of it, um, where I encourage my, uh, my listeners to connect with me. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It's very hit and miss because, like I said, I've got a small audience. I'm not Andy Anako. I don't have the Anako on but every now and then I get a ping from someone, and 90% of the time, this ping is not from a librarian. It's from someone who's just, you know, got, they like tech. And at that point I realized, when I'm getting pings from people who aren't librarians, they might not even be library users, I've got a decision to make. And this is where sort of the audience building thing began. I can keep my focus as technologically minded public librarians, and I can probably have the best damn show for technologically minded public librarians that's on the internet. Or I could broaden out a bit. Now that doesn't sound like that. That's one of those things where you think, well, of course you want to broaden out. You want a bigger audience. Well, do you? Because when I'm talking about tech in public libraries, by God, I know what I'm talking about. When I talk about technology as a whole, Mm, there's people out there that are smarter than me about that. Lots of people about them. You read them on The Verge. You listen to them on Twit. You whatever. So that's a little scary. But being able to step off that edge and say, hey, you know, I've got these people that are interested in this. Is it something I need to do? Because you might think your audience is all this. And this is what any show sort of podcaster wants. They want an audience that is literally forward-leaning, listening to you and you know, taking notes and getting something out of what you say. At least that's the goal. I mean, even the most blatantly stupid comedy podcast is hoping that people laugh. Well, you know, that's fun. This is what you think your audience is. But maybe um, 
it's hard to sort of write down the word cyberpunk librarian without using the word punk. And the fact is, is your audience may not be who you think they are. And that is where you can start building. But it does take a little courage. Because at this point, you know, I can, I can come up here and no one would want to hear it. No one in this room would want to hear me talk about library technology and free and open source software. And if you do, wow, I, I'm sorry. But <laughs> being able to talk about technology in this setting requires some research. It requires me to step outside my own boundary. It requires me to move beyond the things that I know. Because yeah, I know quite a bit about Raspberry Pis, but you know, setting one up in some place that's not a place with books on the walls, I don't know as much about that. So you have to be able to move a little bit beyond that and look at what your audience wants. And the way I kind of metaphorize this, because I like to verb words, is um, basically you can have a fairly big room like this one. We can turn all the lights out here and then we would wonder why we did that. But I could take out one of those really cool green lasers that you see on the news when someone gets arrested for pointing one at a police chopper and point it at that corner. And you would be able to see that green laser on that corner really freaking well in a dark room. You'd be able to see it pretty good in the lighting conditions we have here. But that'd probably be all you'd see. If you're just looking at that green laser and you're really letting your eyes focus on that and you start walking to it, you're going to get something right in the crotch. So, it's better to turn on the lights. And that way, I see everybody here. And this is what I call the home star runner method of building your audience. Everybody, everybody. I realized, and you should realize too, you're going to be wrong on your show. It happens. You're going to say something stupid. You're going to say something. You're going to make a prediction. And it's going to be a prediction that makes perfect sense right now, five minutes from now, five days from now, five weeks from now. And next year, Apple does the thing that you predicted that they're not going to do. And you look like a fool. And I know this has happened because, like I said, I listen to some of the big tech, I listen to some of the big tech networks and podcasting networks. You know how many times Leo Laporte has screwed up predictions? A lot. Like, embarrassingly so. Because, like, you know, kind of like me in some ways, he's just kind of working with the information that he has. So you're going to screw up. You're going to say something wrong. You're going to state something that you thought was correct, and tomorrow something happens and it's no longer correct you can either work around that or you can work with it. And with the everybody, everybody method of audience building, I've chosen to work with it. If I say something stupid on episode, you know, episode five, and by the time episode six rolls around, because my show publishes every two weeks, um, and by the time episode six rolls out and I realize, oh my God, that was dumb, I'll correct it. You, that's all you do. You just say, hey, you remember back on the last episode that you were listening to when I said X, Y, Z? Well, actually, that was totally stupid and wrong. And here is the right information. Because you'll find that librarians as a whole have an overriding philosophy that it is better to have no information than it is to have the wrong information. So if I don't correct that, if, so, if you don't correct that, say you say something stupid because you just didn't know, then they've got the wrong information. So it's better to just go back and say, hey, I said this, it was wrong, that was stupid, sorry, here's how things really are. And just accept the fact that you're going to do it. Now, hitting your target audience is something that every podcaster Every YouTuber, every writer, every author, every blogger wants to do. Because most people, for the most part, unless you're James freaking Patterson, don't set out to write a book for everybody. You write a book for people who like thrillers. You write a book for people who like cozy mysteries. You write a book for people who like high fantasy, whatever. That you're, George Double R. Martin doesn't give a crap about your sci-fi, because that's not what he's writing today. 
So some people will despair, at least with their, you know, their medium of choice, be it YouTube, podcasting, blogging, whatever, that they've missed their bullseye when stuff like this happens. Oh my God, I'm getting questions from people that aren't within my target audience. People are emailing me. People are pinging me on Twitter. They're hitting me up on my website. Number one, I don't know who they are, but I can tell they're not within my target audience. What do I do? You do what you would do in any situation like this and realize that just because you think you missed the bullseye doesn't mean the bullseye was larger than you thought. Your target audience, in many ways, at least in my experience with my little show, um, is your audience. I don't have a target audience anymore, and by God, that's liberating. I sit down in front of a mic, I have my Evernote in front of me that's got my script or my notes or my outline or whatever it is I need for that particular episode. It changes every week, it seems. And I'm just gonna make a show that is sort of kind of aimed at people who have an interest in libraries and or technology. It does not matter what that interest is and which side of that spectrum they fall on. Because there are plenty of librarians that I've talked to at library conferences and stuff like that who aren't all that technologically minded, but they like the library side of my show. And there's people that I've talked to at little conferences like this, tech conferences, that barely remember that I'm talking about libraries because they were interested in the Raspberry Pi project that I'm talking about. They don't care that that took place in a library. It gave them some ideas how they could use it somewhere else. So. Where am I? Good, because I want to get out of here a little bit early so we have time to get to the damn food truck. There's only one food truck, and I've had the grilled cheese, and it's good. So, okay, back to this. So, just because you missed your target audience doesn't mean you missed. It just means that you thought you were using a, you know, a sort of bow and arrow solution when actually you were using a hand grenade. Um, that will come as a shock to you, especially since bow and arrows do not explode, but you come to find out that you might have people listening to your show that you didn't think would listen to your show, that would never have occurred to you to listen to your show, and that is not bad. Work with that. Some people refuse to, and I've actually talked to podcasters who say, I'm not going to change the format of my show. I'm not going to change what I'm talking about. I'm not going to change what I'm doing for this niche audience. Niche audience, dude, unless you're twit, unless you're 5x5, five five, unless you're NPR, you don't have a niche audience. You just have a subset of your niche. So, when it came to changing my format, my style, that wasn't anything at all because I'm a big believer that if you're not changing the style and format of your show, then your show is either stagnating at best or dying at worst. I learn new things from podcasters all the time. You go back and listen to episode one, and it sounds nothing like episode 26, which is what I think I'm up to these days. Um, you'll find that, yes, I ripped some stuff off from Nightwise, because as Picasso is usually attributed to this quote, good artists borrow, great artists steal, and I blatantly steal. Um, you will find that, yes, if you listen to Nightwise's podcast and then mine, you'll see some similarities. You'll find also that if you listen to 99% Invisible, which has almost nothing to do about tech and mine, you'll hear some similarities. You'll hear some similarities between my podcast and things on the 5x5 network and on Twitter and whatever, and I'm not even doing things like that. So if you're going to not change your format of your show to fit your audience, at the very least, change the format of your show because you learned something new. And in the end, you'll probably grow an audience anyway. I'm sure you've seen this at some point on a film, uh, just before the film gets started, usually about the time that the cinema blows your brains through both ears. Um, but I, I came across this when I was looking for a public domain image for something about audience, and it kind of struck me because, you know, Lucasfilm, everybody's heard of Lucasfilm, THX, yeah, big deal. But the audience is listening, and that is the case. Your audience is listening, your audience is watching, your audience is reading. And it doesn't matter if your show or your blog or your video is directed towards technologically minded public librarians, technologically minded people, people who like to sew, people who like to draw. It doesn't matter. If they're listening, if they're watching, if they're reading, that's your audience. Now, whether or not you start catering to a specific portion of that audience, 
that's up to you. But I think you'll find, at least with most performers, that bigger is better, and a bigger audience is nicer. You get more feedback, you get more ideas. You, I hope, are at least doing some kind of podcast, or video on YouTube, or writing online, or whatever it is. Because you have something you want to say, or something you wanted to create, or something that you wanted to put in front of an audience to begin with. And okay, so you missed your audience. You got people in there that you didn't expect to show up. Well, that's that's how it goes. So I want to leave some time at the room for at the uh, end for questions. Um, here is all of my contact information. If you want to take a picture of the slide or whatever, I'd be very happy to talk with you. You know, after the thing or on Twitter or Google Plus or whatever. Um, like I said, I want to leave time for questions and make sure that we can be first in line for that food truck question. So, um, do you have any questions? Podcasting, building an audience. Uh, like I said, I'm a librarian. I get paid to answer questions. Though I'm not getting paid for this. It's a little weird. So working for Skate, I guess. So any questions at all? How did you try to reach out to sort of get known amongst the librarians? That, that part was actually the simple part. Because it's, it's weird um, in some ways how the... I don't want to use the word underground because that sounds sort of like you know, under the table or stealthy or something. But there is a fairly large network of librarians online. Um, there are networked academic librarians, public librarians, all that. Um, to the point where um, I used to do uh, interlibrary loans for the, uh, for the library that I work for. And um, sometimes that's just books. And that's easy to get. There's services you go to if you're in a library, loans librarian, to get the books. No problem. Unless it's some weird rare tome that there's three in existence and there's no way. But sometimes they just need an article. And that's great unless it's an article in the database that I don't have or don't have readily, you know, ready access to. So rather than like going through this whole system, which was set up, to, hey, out there, everybody, I need this article from this journal, these pages on this date. I go to Reddit. <laughs> there is a thing on Reddit, I believe it's called slash R Scholar, where you can go and say, I just need this thing, and people will post it. And I guarantee you most of the people posting replies to that um, to those requests for articles are librarians or people working in libraries. So actually networking with librarians online, that's the easy part because they're already there. Um, and that audience was kind of ready-made. Um, I had done a podcast before on um, another website called uh, LAS News, the Library and Information Science News, um, called Hyperlinked History, because I have a degree in history, strangely enough. Um, so I kind of brought an audience over from that. They, they heard my voice. The people that liked it came along. The people that didn't like it, they stayed away anyhow. So, that part was easy. The surprising part came in when I started getting hits on Twitter from people that weren't librarians. And that's where the, you know, the thing came in because librarians I can talk to, we have something in common. Uh, you, no one goes into library work to get rich. That doesn't happen. Um, so you have to have a passion for the job. So I can talk to other librarians without any issues at all because we share a common passion. Um, it's these people that started messaging me on Twitter and emailing into the show or leaving comments on my site. Where it's like, I, I don't, I, okay, we like tech, but so do billions of other people on the planet. So how do you connect with them? And that's sort of where the, the challenge came in, is connecting with the people that I don't have anything in common with and trying to design and sort of tailor a show that will hit their needs too. So yeah. Yes, ma'am. How long do you spend uh, creating your podcast every week? Well, I do bi-weekly because I just don't have freaking time. <laughs> but, um, so every two weeks, uh, Cyberpunk Librarian drops. Um, it depends on the show. Um, some shows, I start working on it the very second I'm done recording the last show. I mean, it's almost that quick. Okay, great. This is bounced. Everything sounds good. Let me upload it to archive. Let me queue it up on the site. Let me make sure the RSS feed is ready to go and golden. So on the next show, I will be talking about some shows I literally write the day before. Um, that'll be the uh, that'll be the case with this uh, this week's show, for instance. It's uh, going to be kind of a just for fun show because I spent time doing this. 
But um, it all depends on the show, and it all depends on what level I need to talk about. Some shows are very tech-heavy, and that actually requires more, more work, not because of the tech-heaviness. That's easy. It's bringing that heavy tech down to where people can understand it without all the jargon and BS. Um, if it's just something where, uh, hey, we're going to talk about um, ebooks and the best ways to use ebooks and to get your customers to accept ebooks as a thing, that's pretty easy. I can do that in a week. I mean, and that's just off and on. I mean, I don't sit down and work on it, you know, day in, day out. I've got my laptop or iPad on me most of the time, so I can work on it at lunch or wherever I'm at. So yeah, it just depends. Yes, sir. Uh, do you use like a mind mapping tool, or how do you um, go through the you know, thinking the, process for your next show? The the funny thing about that is, is I've tried the little mind mapping tools and the big mind mapping tools, and you know, a whiteboard and all of that. And what it really comes down to is my brain is very simple, and what I really like is just black text on a white screen. So I use Evernote for almost everything in that regard. Um, and it's usually just either a script or an outline. And by outline, I mean just the barest of things. Point one, tab over A, B, C, D. Point two, tab over A, B, C, D. Um, the mind maps are great sort of when I was working on them and looking at them, but I found that if I left and came back more than two hours later, I had no idea what I was looking at anymore. So. With Evernote, when I when I walk away and come back two days later, I can bring up my notes and look at that and say, okay, point three, tab over. <laughs> and yeah. So yeah, I don't use anything special. Uh, for the longest time before I really got hooked on Evernote, I just used a text editor of some kind. Yeah. Anything else? Sweet. Well, my contact information is there. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. It's been a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you for having me. And hey, go to your library or something. Take care. All right. Let me make sure to take this. I paid good money for it two days ago. So which brick and mortar library are you at? I actually or work for Maricopa County Library District. Um, I used to work at the Queen uh, Creek Branch because that's where I live. Um, I was a circulation manager for about 10 years. Before that, I always worked at um, I'm just curious. But the, uh, the lady that used to do our website uh, moved to Florida, of all places. And I told her, because I helped her move, I said, I'm going to totally apply for your job when they open it. And she said, well, don't hold your breath because I don't know what they are. Well, six months later, they finally did. And to be honest, I still don't know why they hired me, because all I did in the interview by that point was sit there for an hour and basically complain about the website and how it looked. Apparently that's what they want. <laughs> they needed somebody who knew everything that was wrong with it. Well, and that kind of, you know, but yeah. But Maricopa County Library District, I were actually work in downtown Phoenix at our administrative offices when I have to. If I can work anywhere else. <laughs> hey, can I help you? How do you plan to implement the library? At this time, we've got two projects going. Um, I've got a, uh, we've got these things, and I'm sure you've seen them in other places. They've probably got some downstairs, um, called Potomac boxes, and they're digital signage. Mm -hmm. you know, so you hook it to a screen, it shows slides, glorify power. Yeah. Well, those things are about 800 bucks a piece for the mm -hmm. box. And it's like, you know, this is stupid. Yes. So I started digging into Raspberry Pi stuff, and for like a $35 computer and free and open source software and a small adapter that costs 10 bucks, mm -hmm. you can do the same thing with a, a software called Screenly OSC, mm -hmm. Open Source Edition. So I started fiddling with that, and we're probably going to use one as like a digital shelf talker yeah. where you oh, put okay. it on an end cap like they got at Walmart. Mm -hmm. Only ours won't make noise because that's yeah. rotating, and it's a library. Um, the other thing I'm kind of working on with them is, um, have you ever heard of a library box? I'm, I'm not so sure. There's, a, there's this thing called a pirate box, mm -hmm. and it's basically a thing where you, it's its own router. You can set it in a room. People can connect to it. They can download content from it. They can upload content to it. It's basically a method of pirating stuff. Mm -hmm. I love the idea. Mm -hmm. A guy named Jason Griffey took the idea, morphed it a little bit, and created this thing called a library box, where you can't upload stuff to it. Mm -hmm. And it also keeps statistics, which is like the second thing that librarians love more than yes. books. Um, so we're looking at putting one of those in a couple different places, but the problem is, is because of its being its own router, yeah. managing it from a remote location is a pain in the ass. 
unless you hook a library box to it and you can you know get into the library box and then secure shell into the library box yeah. and, and into the raspberry pi and then secure shell into the library box so that's a couple things um one one other thing that i'm just playing with is uh using one for a program like a makerspace at a library where we set it up as a web server mm -hmm. and people can yeah. upload stuff to it and fiddle with it and in some cases i'm going to set one up and say okay Hack it. Yeah. See what you can do. Can you can you own this box? Mm -hmm. And you know, see what happens. Yeah. But yeah, stuff like that. You know. Yeah. And the great thing is, is they're cheap and yes. they can be repurposed. All you have to do is pull out the uh, SD card and put in a new SD yes. card. Exactly. There you go. Exactly. So it, I, know, I don't like about it is it's small RAM. That's yes. Like yes. You can't really. Use and and what I tell people is, it's really good at doing one thing. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. If you want to do two things, you are. Pushing the limits in three, <laughs> don't bother. Because um, I've I, I tried different operating systems on there, mm -hmm. and what I normally do now, I have it as my home theater. Yeah, I, yeah, I, it's I great for a SBMC, yeah. Server and then, yeah, and I use, I use it like that. Mm -hmm. But when you try to use it like for the web base or anything like that, it takes like Just five minutes or so. Yeah. yeah. It, it mm -hmm. will serve websites, it will not access them yeah. very well. Exactly. So, <laughs> yeah, then well, you're better off with links. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Mm -hmm. No, very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming by. Hey, hey enjoy the